In yesterday's discussion, we arrived at the point where the stage was set for a showdown battle between the Truck Drivers Union, Local 574, and the trucking bosses of Minneapolis. Tonight, I want to begin by examining some of the major aspects of the preparations for that battle, particularly as these things illustrate the decisive role of a class-conscious leadership in union struggles. The Trotskyists, who were the actual leaders of the action, had no illusions about what the union was up against. They were fully aware from the outset that the bosses were going to refuse to deal with the union and try instead by every possible means to smash the union. They were equally aware that none of the politicians, whether or not, they appeared in the guise of friends of labor, could be relied on in any way to aid and support the union as against the bosses, that the situation would be just the opposite. Also, that the general run of the official union leadership throughout the whole town would be scared to death of the action would crumble under pressure and would, in the last analysis, be treacherous. They were consequently fully aware that, in the last analysis, the outcome of the fight would hinge on the capacity of a class-conscious leadership to mobilize the workers, lead and teach the workers in the course of the action, and undertake to break through all the barriers to the unionization of the truck drivers by the power of the rank and file of the, that section of the working class involved in the struggle. Let us look first at the consciousness with which the Trotskyists developed their strategy concerning relations with Governor Floyd Olson, then the executive head of the state of Minnesota. Olson was the elected candidate of the Farmer Labor Party as it existed at that time in Minnesota. Today, the Farmer Labor Party has been fused with the Democratic Party and is called the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. And it is nothing more nor less than the Minnesota section of the Democratic Party with the name Farmer Labor Party hanging on as an appendage and without any meeting. But at that time, the Farmer Labor Party existed as a separate political entity in the state of Minnesota. It was basically a workers and farmers organization enjoying substantial support both in the towns and in the countryside from the working people and the working farmers. 
although, of course, there were numerous middle-class elements in it. It was a reformist party acting on the political arena in the name of achieving reforms for the workers and farmers under the capitalist system, and it was semi-independent of the two-party system in the sense that within the state of Minnesota, it ran its own candidates, for instance, for governor, as against both the Democrats and Republicans, but nationally, it functioned in a coalition with the Roosevelt New Deal. To a politically conscious person with a class understanding, it was therefore evident that Olson, as a farmer laborite in the governor's chair, was in a peculiar position. And to think this out in advance and know how to proceed because of this was very important to the good and welfare of the strike that was to come. On the positive side, from the point of view of the workers, was the fact that it was politically dangerous for Olson to act openly as a strike breaker. He couldn't step out as would a Democratic or Republican governor at, at that juncture within the state in, uh, in uh, crass support of the bosses and against the workers. On the other side, it was necessary to recognize in advance that in the showdown that was to come, there would be juncture after juncture in which Olson was sure to maneuver against the Union. Now, the, the contradiction was present, but so long as the Union leadership was aware of it and knew how to approach it, it became Olson's contradiction and not the Union's contradiction. And from that it followed that the problem of the Union leadership was to devise the best possible way to take advantage of Olson's contradiction. Recognizing this in advance and beginning to prepare well in advance of the actual strike, the Union leadership opened the gambit by putting Olson on record as sympathetic to the Union aim. This was done at an early stage in the spring of 1934, about six weeks after the successful coal strike and a month or so before the first general truck driver strike uh, developed in May. <coughs> You recall I described to you yesterday how the volunteer organizers that had come out of the coal yards and had been victimized by the bosses after the strike was won had been out working both sides of the street all over town, organizing drivers and inside workers and holding meetings with them in which the workers had a voice in shaping the demands that were going to be presented to the bosses. As this general momentum developed, it became appropriate and necessary and possible to hold a general organization mass meeting. For the purpose, the union rented for a night a downtown theater and got out a lot of publicity. Now, by the way, here's a little factor that will, in another sense, illustrate the difference between the politically conscious 
factors that are now in Local 574 and the old line leadership. The organizing committee went before the union executive board and asked for an appropriation to pay a printer to get out a batch of leaflets advertising this organization meeting to summon the workers to this theater. And one of the members of the executive board said, what do you want money for leaflets for? These guys all know where our headquarters is and they know we've been here for years and if they want to come down, they'll come down. Why we got to spend good union money to have a printer tell these guys where we're at? <laughs> this was just typical <laughs> of the mentality we were running up against. Well, we got the appropriation, got the leaflet out, held the meeting. And a formal invitation was extended to Governor Olson to appear at the meeting. And he accepted the invitation, and the leaflet announced that Governor Olson would speak. Now, he didn't turn up. But here you begin to see how the contradiction in Olson operated to the union's benefit, where you had a conscious leadership. Olson couldn't just stay away, so he sent a letter to the meeting. And we had him on record in, in even better form than if he had made an oral presentation at the meeting itself. Well, it was right there on the official letterhead of the governor of the sovereign state of Minnesota, signed Floyd B. Olson, in which he, in a careful and cautious way, but nevertheless with sufficient positiveness to serve the necessary advantages, gave approbation and approval to what the workers were asking, what they were striving to do. Now, as I say, the conscious leadership was wholly aware that this couldn't be taken at face value. But it helped in various ways from time to time as the going got rough in the battles that were to come, and particularly when Olson would begin to maneuver and wiggle around and do some pretty desperately drastic things in an effort to get out of the contradiction he was caught in. That was one aspect of the preparation. Now let's look at it from another point of view. What concretely did it mean when we say that the union leadership was wholly conscious from the outset this was going to be a showdown fight with no old bars. How was this reflected in the other aspects of the preparation for the battle? First, let me make the generalization that everything about the physical preparation for the strike were calculated to demonstrate to the bosses, to the workers, to the politicians, to all the union bureaucrats around town that the union meant business. We began the truck driver strike, their mobile strikes. We began by renting a huge garage. It was about a block long and probably as wide as two-thirds the, the distance from here to there, this building. Equipped so that the picket cars could drive in and out, which was necessary for a series of reasons. Within the headquarters, a commissary was established where the strikers could be fed on a mass basis. Before the strike began, thinking in terms of the probability of a siege, relief committees were organized within the Union to go out and chisel groceries from friendly merchants, 
go and explain the facts of life to landlords that had to depend on the working class for their rent when they got too tough with the striker about his rent, and to see that strikers who deserved help got it, and at the same time to safeguard the union against chiselers and freeloaders. And these relief committees came right out of the ranks of the union. In addition to the facilities for the mobilization and dispatching of the pickets, the commissary and the relief committees, we erected a hospital in the strike headquarters and secured the services of two doctors and three trained nurses who on a virtually volunteer basis functioned on full time in the headquarters once the action got underway and the hospital began to be used. Now we had another situation that is of particular interest. We found as the action got underway that the cops had our telephone lines tapped. They had police spies around in one and another way, shape, and form. And when we first began to dispatch pickets, receive calls from a picket detachment in trouble with the cops out someplace, or to dispatch pickets to someplace where we found that an outfit was trying to operate that shouldn't, we learned that the cops would be there ahead of us. It didn't take us long to figure out that, that uh, they, they, they had, uh, by the uh, device of tapping our phone and other means, this inside information. So there was a particular contingent of volunteers that turned up in the strike that we organized into a courier service. They were the counterpart in 1934 of the young men and women you see all dressed up in the garb for the occasion that ride motorcycles. The equivalent of the packs that were dramatized in that picture that Marlon Brando played, and I forget the name of the picture. The Wild Ones. These were the Wild Ones of 1934. They turned to, and, and we had the most magnificent kind of a courier service. Uh, in addition to the picketing detachments, uh, we had picketing marshals stationed at various areas around town in the, in the uh, strategic places, and our couriers passed back and forth between the marshals out in the field and the general staff at the headquarters, bringing in reports and taking back orders. And they enjoyed to the full the action that young people of that kind have an instinctive yearning for, and in the process they've made a substantial contribution to a first-class social cause. The small difference between what happens to youth when class struggle is in the air and what happens to youth when the whole atmosphere is permeated with reaction and everything that is reprehensible about capitalist society, as is the case today. In addition to the couriers, the Union quickly developed an intelligence service once the action began. And here, spontaneity came to the fore in a very remarkable form. We enjoyed a striking demonstration of solidarity from girls of working class families who were employed as stenographers and secretaries in the offices of the bosses. We began to get anonymous mail at the strike headquarters. Sometimes it was obvious that a boss had dictated a letter <coughs> and the stenographer had just slipped an extra carbon in <laughs> that the boss hadn't specified and had used his stationery and his stamp <laughs> to mail it to the strike headquarters. 
Other times we'd get a uh, we'd get a piece of paper that had obviously it had been all crumpled up and thrown in a wastebasket. It would show all those signs, but it would have been smoothed out, carefully folded, and addressed anonymously to the strike headquarters. And as you can see, in more ways than one, we were able to look down the boss's throats because some of this anonymous intelligence that was coming to us was coming right out of the headquarters of the Citizens Alliance itself, the central boss organization that I described briefly to you last night that was ramrodding the whole thing from the point of view of the bosses. <clears throat> In the development of the picking, as I say, it was a mobile strike for all the circumstances that are attendant upon the nature of the trucking industry, and it was, in fact, one of the initial cases of the development of the flying squadron which became strikingly prevalent during the great surge of the CIO in basic industry that was to come later. I won't attempt too much to discuss the flying squads right at this point because you're going to meet them several times in the course of this evening out in action. And I think it'll begin to give you a pretty good feel of uh, what a flying squadron meant. Let us then turn to a brief look at responsiveness in support of the strike from other areas in the working class of the town. Unorganized workers, not in maximum numbers, but in significant numbers, from virtually every quarter of such industry as there was around town, turned to as volunteers to help. And it was a very common thing for workers who were on jobs that are not in any way involved in the strike to put in their whole day at work and then come down and spend the whole night either doing night picketing when things were quiet in order to spell off the drivers themselves so that they could concentrate more on the on the daytime picketing when the when the job was the toughest or to help around the strike headquarters and maybe be working in the commissary and along about four o'clock in the morning when they'd done everything that they could do they'd stretch out on one of the tables that was used to feed the strikers and get a couple of hours sleep on those boards and get up and go and put in another day's work come quitting time now, right back again at the strike headquarters. This was not at all uncommon among workers who had jobs, but were in, in uh, areas of employment around town that weren't directly involved in the strike. Yet another category was the unemployed workers, who had been waging their own battles in one and another form, which is a story in itself that we can't go into without getting too far afield from the main theme of the general subject before us, had, they were like the Negro masses today. They had everything to gain and damn little or nothing to lose. And they turned to in the strike with a will. And some of them proved to be some of the best fighters in the actions that were to come. Then the question of the farms. We had a problem with the farmers in the first of the general truck strikes from which we learned a lesson and we made the necessary correction and when we came to the second general battle we had the farmers solidly on our side. What was involved primarily was truck farmers in the general vicinity of the city who brought their fruit, their berries, their vegetables, and one thing and another down into the market area where a substantial uh, space was stalled off 
and the stalls were rented to the truck farmers, and they would come early in the morning with their truckloads of produce. And uh, you should keep in mind that at that time, the chain stores hadn't evolved to the point they have today, and the small corner grocery where people did their training was uh, tra trading was much more prevalent. And the small grocer would come down about six o'clock in the morning and meet the truck farmer coming in and backing his truck into his allotted stall in the market. And the grocer would pick up his fruit and his uh, green stuff for the day's sales. And since some of the major fighting, or a matter of fact, in the first strike, the major fighting was going to take place right in this area, we, without intending to, without wanting to, we actually strangled the, the truck farmers uh, for a period from carrying out their, uh, their necessary uh, trade with the, uh, with the grocers. Of course, the bosses wanted this. This is one of the places where, well, uh, it was one of the few places, I think I can honestly say, but it was one of the places where at the outset they thought just a little bit ahead of us. And in the first battle, there was quite a little antagonism developed against the Union. But we learned a lesson from it. And when we came to the second strike, in advance of the strike, through small farmers' organizations, such as one called the, the, the Farm Holiday Association, which was the counterpart at that time of what the National Farm Organization is that's beginning to gestate today, through organizations such as that, we came to an arrangement with the truck farmers. And the union got, took over at least a big parking lot and, and gave the, uh, the farmers stalls in there without rent, unlike what they had down in the regular market. And when we got into the second strike, the farmers came to the union-provided uh, marketplace, and the grocers came there, and the battle went on someplace else, and they paid no attention, and to show their appreciation, they went a long ways toward helping us keep the strike commissary stocked. It was very helpful. <coughs> As a matter of fact, as the preparations of this kind and responses of this kind became manifest and the first actions in the strike began, it was so inspiring that even some of the union bureaucrats responded. One of them, he was a business agent of the plumbers union. He hadn't done a day's work for quite a while, and he'd been eating very high on the hog. And he was, well, shall I say, somewhat on the portly side. Yet he got so picked up by what was happening that, lo and behold, he digs his old plumber's kit out of the mothballs, puts on an oversized pair of coveralls, and turns to it the strike headquarters and starts fixing the leaks <laughs> in the spigots and the sink and the commissary. <laughs> but these were the exception of the rule. I say it to do justice to them. The general theme among the union bureaucrats was to be apprehensive about all this preparation for battle. It would be kind of like a like a pacifist who says, well, it's all right, you know, to mobilize an army and even put union uniforms on them and teach them how to march, but when you give them guns, that's going too far. <laughs> now, we weren't giving out guns, but we were making it crystal clear that this army is being mobilized to fight by the best means it can, commensurate with the situation that workers find themselves in, in a class struggle under capitalist rule where all the edges are on the boss's side. And this scared the union bureaucrats, and they put just the opposite emphasis that the leadership of Local 574 did on the question of Olson. Their theme was, let Olson lead. Don't do all this that you're doing. Don't go out of here and pick fights with the cops as we were accused of doing. We were beginning to scuffle with the cops, as you will see, but uh, we weren't picking fights. They asked for it. Let Olson lead. He's Labor's friend. And at every turn, when Olson maneuvered against the strike, and as we progress tonight, I'll show you some of the main maneuvers, what they, the dangers that they contained within them and how they were fought off. 
They apologized for Olson. And at every juncture in the showdown fights that were to come when, when, when what amounted to a civil war on the streets developed, they blocked all efforts that were raised by workers and other unions to declare sympathy strikes with the truck drivers. That was the real role of the bureaucrats. <clears throat> As of the beginning of the strike in May, proceeding from the outset with the kind of an organized structure that I have briefly described to you, the drivers, supporting workers, unorganized from other industries, the unemployed, the strikers and all the friends of the strikers within the ranks of the working class of the city turned to by the thousands. We began to organize our flying squadrons, stationary picket lines here and there, started policing the trucking industry of the town. And the first day was really something. These strikers had no experience for the overwhelming majority of the workers involved, they had never before had an experience of this kind in any way, shape, or form. And picture the scene. Never before had there been this kind of a battle in this town. Never before had the workers had any experience. Nobody except the most conscious leadership in the strike had the remotest idea what's about to happen. So here's all these thousands of tickets out. And wherever they found a truck, they did the only thing that come naturally. They brought it to the strike headquarters and asked for orders of what to do. Within three or four hours after the truck opened, that was a bedlam around that headquarters. There were truck loads of hogs and cattle, <laughs> <laughs> loads of coal, milk wagons. You know, you know, I told you about these tea and coffee drivers who went out and peddled tea and coffee and salves and farmer's almanac. Some of those standing around there. Everything they brought in. Well, after about 24 hours, we got that, we got that straightened out. And uh, the situation began to stabilize. <coughs> the biggest trouble we were having was with the newspapers. And I think it won't come as a surprise to you when I tell you the newspapers were somewhat misrepresenting the strike. The workers didn't like it. And moreover, they were trying to run trucks out to deliver these lying papers under police protection. So we, uh, we de designated, the, the, uh, the picket dispatchers designated what was intended to be a vigilance picket line. We didn't think it was quite appropriate to join the first issue right here. But the pickets took it their own hands and they descended on what was called Newspaper Alley certain street there where all the newspapers were one next to another and the trucks were loaded. Uh, there were what they called independent truck owners that worked in cons various construction uh, projects. I had these little two and a half ton trucks that hauled sand and gravel and stuff like that. They were very handy. You, know, you, could, you could load uh, oh, from 20 to uh, 35, pick it into the back end of one of those, depending on how urgent it was to get a lot of people there in a hurry. Yeah. In this kind of a strike, you know, in, in uh, many cases, uh, you follow the maximum of Forrest, the, uh, the uh, Confederate uh, cavalry commander in the Civil War. It says, <laughs> says the, the main uh, law in cavalry tactics is that the one that wins is the one that gets there the fastest with the mostest. <laughs> and, and this was the factor that was present in the transportation of pickets. They descend upon Newspaper Alley and the cops reinforced themselves. The newspapers had a gang of, uh, of private cops from the Burns Detective Agency, and they proceeded to work over the pickets and gave quite a few of them a beating, men and women. Up to this point in the preliminary stages, not only the, uh, not only the strikers, but the wives of strikers, Women working in other industries, there were very few women employed except in office work in the trucking industry, had been on the picket line. And they beat women just as mercilessly as they beat men. 
After this experience, in the situation that was quickly to follow, in which the fighting got really brutal, the division of labor was such that it fell to the men to constitute the picket detachments, and the women formed themselves into supporting forces that functioned in a whole series of ways. Once every man was needed on the picket line, the women immediately took over the commissary. The women immediately took over the general staffing of the relief committee. They took over the, the auxiliary functions of helping the doctors in the, and the nurses in the hospital, which in the strike headquarters, which by now um, is, is becoming uh, uh, very necessary. When in the second strike we launched the strike daily that I will speak about later, the women played a very big role in all of the tasks attendant upon the production of that paper and especially in the distribution of the paper. And at various crucial points in the strike, when, when uh, the battle was very rough and the Union found itself in one or another kind of a crisis, the women organized themselves in, in very impressive forces and made demonstrations before City Hall, barged in in force into the office of the mayor, into the council chamber, into the office of the chief of the police, went over to the state capitol in St. Paul and gave the governor and the state legislature the same treatment. In short, just raised hell generally with the authorities. Because of, the, because of the situation, they were, they were letting the bosses precipitate, or more accurately, helping the bosses to precipitate, or even more actively, carrying out for the bosses at the boss's order. In addition to that, as the newspapers continued to lie about the strike, the women would form uh, uh, demonstrations in front of the newspaper buildings and let one and all who could hear in any quarter know that those rags they're printing upstairs there are lying about our strike. In, in, uh, in ways of that kind, there was a tremendous and a vital solidarity between the men and the women in the strike. And it's an important thing to take note of, not only in the mass movement, but in all sectors of the labor movement, including and above all, in the conscious revolutionary party of the working class. Labor, in whatever form, its organization at the given juncture, never in the last analysis has a really solid and complete and wholly undetached member until it has both the husband and the wife. And in the ways I've sought briefly to indicate this was demonstrated to the hilt in this strike by the solidarity of the men and women. It was not just the truck drivers was on strike, it was the families of the truck drivers that were on strike. And the women weren't sitting at home grousing because the men weren't bringing home dough to pay the grocer and the landlord. In one way or another, they were out there helping in the battle. And the response there was just as broad, just as general, and just as complete as it was among the men in the strike. <clears throat> right after this attack on the pickets in newspaper row that I just described, open preparations began for what was to culminate about three days, four days later in what is known as the Battle of Deputy Run. Right after the attack in newspaper row, the newspapers themselves opened a big blast 
on the criminal anarchy of the strike, on the Reds that were leading it, on these outside agitators that ought to go back to Russia, about how these poor misguided truck drivers who never had it so good in their life were being led down the garden path, as the British say. And the mayor announced that he was going to re begin recruiting special deputies to enforce law and order. We didn't have television in those days, but we did have radio. And every hour on the hour, Saturday, all day Sunday, the latest bulletin would be announced as to how many deputies the chief of police had sworn in. And along about the shank of the evening on Sunday, the figure they were announcing over the radio had climbed above 2,000. And all day Sunday, they had begun to announce that in the enforcement of law and order, that the delivery of all forms of merchandise in the city of Minneapolis was going to be restored to normal come Monday morning, the beginning of the work week. This was the preparation from the boss's side. At the strike headquarters, <coughs> The striker's reaction to the attack in newspaper row, the mood of the strikers, the recognition of the workers of the need for and their manifest determination to go through with a showdown fight, took form along these lines. Along toward the latter part of the afternoon on Saturday, a police prowl car pulled up in front of the strike headquarters, two cops in it. They jump out with their club in hand, their coats pulled back from their holstered revolver so there'll be nothing in the way of reaching for it. And with all the impudence and authority of a cop, they charge into the headquarters announcing they've got a report that some truck driver's been kidnapped and either he's going to be turned over right here and now or they're going to jail the, the uh, strike leadership. Just about two minutes and 32 seconds by the clock, later, these same two cops are laying out on the sidewalk in front of the headquarters waiting for an ambulance to take them to the hospital. <laughs> this was the first, first response that showed the mood. As a matter of fact, I recall one scene. There were so many workers in that headquarters anxious to get at those cops that they slugged one another a few times, you know, and trying to reach over one another's shoulder to hit the cop. I remember one big ice wagon driver, he was, a, oh, he was a big, strong man, and he's tall, and he's reaching over two other pickets to try to bash the cop over the head with an improvised club, and in the scuffle, he got moved, and he broke the arm of one of the pickets in front of him, and he broke down and cried, and like the old man that married at 90, not for love, but for spite, he was crying more for the fact he had missed the cop than he was that he broke his fellow picket's arm. <laughs> that was the mood. <clears throat> Saturday night, all day Sunday, the union, the rank and file of the strike, are preparing to see that law and order is upheld working class style come the opening of the work week on Monday. You look around the headquarters, and here you'll find the worker has brought his garden hose. He's got a pair of tins here. He's cutting the garden hose up into about 14 inch lengths. Another one has come in with a couple of big bags of, bags of washers and a few, a few rolls of, uh, of uh, friction tape. And they take the washers and they tamp them all inch to an inch and a half. 
thickness of washers into the end of the hose, wrap tape around it so that the washers won't fly out, put a little tape around the other end for a handle. You know, it makes a pretty good improvised blackjack extended style. Another detachment goes down the switch yards and they start cutting the hoses, the air hoses, <laughs> off, the, off the freight cars, uh, uh, on the sidings in, in the yards. Here comes a worker not in the strike, but for the strike, down the street with his son's coaster wagon. Got stakes on the side. What do they call them? Noodle posts that you have, you know, from the first and second floor of the house. And they were, they were just right for clubs. So he'd got a saw and he'd sawed all these posts <laughs> out, of, out of the stair railing, had them, had them ricked up in the kids' coaster wagon, brought them down, donation to the strike. Uh, members of the Carpenters' Union turned two on Sunday, no overtime, and uh, brought with them a big batch of two-by-twos and worked like beavers sawing these two-by-twos. Well, by Monday morning, the, uh, the uh, truck drivers were well enough to quip to, as they say, at least get a lunch while the cops were getting a meal. And with this came Monday. Now, I want to make something clear, and it's important. There's been quite a bit written about the Battle of Deputy Run and the general tendency of the modern newspaper reporter that writes about this or author of a book as the case may be there have been some is to telescope the whole thing into the clash which took place on Tuesday where two deputies got killed now it's important to clarify this because it carries the connotation that the attitude of the harness bulls, that is the regular uniform cops, on, on the Tuesday, the day of the Battle of Deputy Run, was their attitude in the whole fight. That just is not so. Actually, the main fight and, and the most vital fight took place on Monday. Come Monday morning, here's practically the whole uniform police department mobilized down in the market area. They're going to move one truck uh, away from one of the large vegetable and produce houses. And they've got deputies there by the hundreds. There was quite a bit of law congregated around the place. And the truck drivers and their allies <coughs> turned to an equal force. Now, first of all, this fight on Monday was mainly insofar as the forces involved were concerned, the truck drivers against the cops and the deputies. Secondly, what happened was that the minute the fighting started, and I won't go into the details of how it started, but the minute the fighting started and it became clear that the truck drivers are going to stand their ground and defend themselves against the police attack on their picket lines as best they could, the deputies cut and run. And it became a stand-up fight between the truck drivers and the regular uniform cops. Well, we filled the headquarters hospital with truck driver casualties that day, but also the truck drivers put over 50 cops in the hospital. And this became a symbol of the changing situation. And the upshot of it was that the day's fight came to a draw and they abandoned trying to pull out that truck. I might give you, there's one other factor that helps illustrate the value of the flying squadron. There was one point, it was generally club against club. There was no shooting by the cops on that day. The shooting won't come until the second strike. It was generally club against club, but there was one tight point, just as the fighting was coming to its climax, where the cops drew their guns. And they were 
sort of, they'd worked themselves into an area where they were pretty well congregated, and they had a perimeter of clear fire against the truck drivers. Now, on this day, unlike Tuesday, it was the kind of a fight where you could execute a little tactical maneuver here and there during the strike, and we saw the, uh, during the fight. And when we saw what the situation was, we checkmated the cops when they pulled their guns by throwing three or four truckloads of pickets into the middle of the thing, putting drivers in that were the kind of guys that would carry out their orders, and the order was don't stop for anything and don't stop until you've driven right into the middle of this gang of cops. The object was the pickets poured out of the trucks in, am uh, in among the cops, and now the cops couldn't fire without risk of shooting themselves. That is, they'd lost their, their clear perimeter of fire, and we'd, we'd checkmated the guns. And it was, it was this action that sort of settled the thing for the day. The police chief ordered the truck brought back in. Now, they hadn't given up, but they had decided they'll come back tomorrow, and they'll try to be prepared to handle what they had met and couldn't handle on Monday. Well, you can imagine how the newspapers appeared that night. You can imagine what the radio broadcasts were, and it wasn't exactly a surprise to anybody around town. The next day, come sunrise, there's already <laughs> people all over the market getting grandstand seats, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, ra the main radio station has got a panel truck down there with a... a done like, like we sometimes do with our street meetings. They put a platform up on top of the panel truck and had, had it lashed on there, had, a, had an announcer sitting up there in a chair strapped onto the platform with a microphone in front of him. He's going he's gonna to give one of Murrow's You Are There <laughs> accounts of, of what's going to take place on, on Tuesday in the market. And uh, <clears throat> with the... Uh, passage in the morning, people come more and more by the thousands. The law is there again in full force in terms of the regular cops and the deputies are back. Finally comes the preparations to move the truck and the tension was so great that what started the fighting this time was not a, a, a move against the pickets by the cops as it happened on Monday to try to break a picket line in order to, uh, in order to uh, uh, get the truck through. What started the fighting was that some prankster probably had a grievance against this particular company, found a crate of oranges out on the sidewalk and he picked it up and hurled it through a plate glass window of one of the, one of the marketplaces. And the crash and the sound of the falling glass is all it took, you know, to just trigger the whole thing. And then, uh, within a matter of minutes, it was Katie bar the door. Now, it turned out that the regular cops, the harness bulls, resented the way the deputies had run the day before. And before long, a tacit understanding developed between the pickets and the cops that if the pickets didn't go directly toward the cops in the battle that was to happen. The cops wouldn't break their necks going to the aid of the special deputies if the pickets went in that direction. There was no negotiation. It was just one of those things that happens with a, in a split second in a, in a uh, crisis. It, it, was the, it was in a way somewhat parallel of the description Trotsky gives in the history of the Russian Revolution of the symbolism of uh, the way the worker ducked under the horse of the Cossack and the Cossack winked. And with that, the workers began just going beyond the Cossacks and going after the Pharaohs. You remember the passage in the history. Uh, it, it, was, it was the counterpart of that. And in the fighting that followed, it wasn't so much a matter of the deputies standing and fighting as it was that they got mousetrapped. They got surrounded. We looked over the ground during the night. We had noticed where they ran the day before, and we closed off a couple of uh, what P.T. Barnum called egresses. 
and they couldn't run as fast as they could before, and they began to get worked over. And these wealthy men from Lowry Hill, the residential district of the big money in town at that time, these these uh, well-to-do sportsmen that thought they were going to come down and have a holiday beating truck drivers overhead in the name of law and order. One of them come down with a polo hat on. He got the polo hat pounded into his head. They didn't fare so well. As a matter of fact, two of them got killed that day. And plenty of them got hospitalized. And before long, they were ripping off their deputy badges. They were dropping their clubs. They were doing everything that they could do to try to find anonymity. They no longer wanted to be recognized as deputies. And the pickets uh, not only cleaned them out of the market, they chased them for blocks in every direction. <coughs> this brought to a climax the attempt at this juncture to break the strike by smashing the police, the uh, picket lines through police force. And what happened was that a truce developed. As a matter of fact, the sheriff at one juncture late that day uh, came forward as the intermediary and an understanding was arrived at which it is true limited the number of tickets that would be on the street but what was different was it also limited the number of cops that would be on the street. It, it was a a negotiated truce. In short, there was a stalemate. Now, in a sense, you stop and think about this for a moment, you're seeing what amounts to a fleeting instant of dual power. In a strike, in a battle taking place right on the streets of a city in the United States of America. <clears throat> it could be only an instant because of all the features I sought to describe to you yesterday that made this exceptional. It could be only a demonstration of what that kind of class power led and used on a national scale could have accomplished but it could accomplish nothing more than to safeguard the Union from the attack and permit the truck drivers to go forward in their battle to establish their Union. Only a Union contract was possible, but right then and there, at that moment, in that key fight, the thing happened that was to change the whole character of that town. From that moment, it was on the way from an open shop town to a union town. At least that much was accomplished. It still had to be cinched up. That, that victory was won by the truck drivers that day, and it was a tremendous victory to reach a stalemate in a stand-up fight with the organized police force of a town had to be defended against new attacks on it, but that was the beginning of the victory. <coughs> now, while this is going on, a telegram arrives at the Union headquarters, signed by Daniel J. Tobin, the General President of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters ordering us to arbitrate our differences with the bosses. We were busy down in the market. There was a screwball congressman, my name was Shoemaker, wandering around trying to get some publicity for himself, and he wanders into the strike headquarters, and here he sees laying on the table, there's hardly anybody around, we're all down in the market, he sees laying on the table here a telegram and told him addressed to Bill Brown, the President of the Union, ordering to arbitrate. The shoemaker was just that kind of a screwball. He took it upon himself to answer. He's, he answered in the right spirit, but here's what he wired back to Tobin, and he signed Bill Brown's name to it. 
Dear Sir, keep your scabby nose and scaly face out. This is a fight for human rights, your rat job not involved. Well, as you can understand, it didn't exactly improve our relations with Tobin. <laughs> Even though it, even though it did, it did echo the reality of the moment. But what had happened was that the workers had enforced their own law as against the capitalist legal structure, and a stalemate had been arrived at, and some negotiations had to take place. The bosses still wouldn't meet the union directly, so Olson came in as the media, and through his mediation. An agreement was arrived at that gave recognition to the union, established an increase in pay and other conditions. It wasn't the best contract in the world, but it was a start, and the strike was settled. The strike could no more than settle, and the strikers returned to work, and we find we've been double-crossed by Olson. Remember I told you there's drivers and inside workers. What Olson had done, it turned out, apparently, was to tell us that the recognition was for both drivers and inside workers, and he told the bosses it was for drivers only. Now you can see what, what was involved here. The aim was to split the union ranks, get us off the streets, the workers back on the job, and now the drivers had recognition and increases in pay, provisions for hours, and so on, they figured you wouldn't be able to get them back out again, and the inside workers would go by the board. That would have been more than half of the union. This would enable them also to keep the union pretty much restricted to the narrow craft structure that was safe for the bureaucrats and for reformist politicians like Olson and would lay the foundation for them to try to clean out the radicals in the leadership of the union and restore the status quo ante. That was the scheme. Now, before I come to the next point, I've been talking just about an hour. It'll take another half to three-quarters of an hour to go through the second strike. What is your... What is your judgment? Shall I go part way and then we take telescope a little more tomorrow? Or shall I finish the second strike tonight? Okay. Now we come to the question that was asked about the Communist Party, the Stalinists. It is at this juncture that the Stalinists make their first major attack on the strike leadership. They used for that device a man by the name of William F. Dunn, the elder of the Dunn brothers, blood brother to Vincent, Grant, and Raymond, who were three of the foremost uh, leaders in the strike, but who, unlike them, had stayed in the Communist Party and supported Stalin in the split that took place in 1928, whereas Ray and Miles and Grant had gone with the Trotsky's cadre. They come out with a pamphlet entitled Counter-Revolution in Minneapolis. Now, what was one of the central points that it shows you what kind of renegades and reformists and traitors of the working class we are? that we hadn't gone right on and seized power and extended power as of the culmination of the Battle of Deputy Run. And there were all kinds of additions, but that was the, the essence of it and, and gives you the, uh, the central feel of the situation. At that time, the Communist Party was in its third period, as it was called, when the whole norm of their procedure was to try to substitute the vanguard for the mass in simulated <coughs> class actions and advance the most extreme demands in those struggles. Where they had taken the militants of the Communist Party out of the established unions 
and tried to build what they called a red trade union international. And where all they had succeeded in doing was in isolating the militants of the Communist Party from the masses and pursuing a policy that made it impossible for them to make fusion with the spontaneous masses at that point in struggle in any way, shape, or form. Now, they had no influence in the truck drivers' union. As a matter of fact, the leadership of the union had to protect them from the strikers. There was a kind of a mixed reaction on the part of the Trotskyists, because this is now six years after the split in 1928. And following the split in 1928, down through those years, the Communist Party had been sending goon squads to break up Trotskyist meetings. They had barged into meetings like this, rushed in and beat up people in the hall. And the upshot of it was that the Communist Party was unable to have any influence on the strike, <coughs> unable in any way to turn the the uh, membership against the strike leadership, just the opposite. Now, in fact, we had a new kind of problem for us. Olson's double cross had forced us into what was to become yet another general truck driver strike, and as you'll see, an even rougher one, than that that I have just uh, described to you. This strike that's coming now posed some new strategic and tactical problems for the leadership. It was necessary to assume from the outset the probability of new and more vicious forms of police violence, namely gunfire, in the next strike. It was necessary to expect in advance new forms of treachery against the Union through the maneuvers of Olson with the backing of the Union bureaucrats. It was necessary to find a way to keep the drivers solidarized with the inside workers within 574 and to mobilize general labor support for renewal of the struggle. And it was necessary also to get this new stage of conflict on the road to begin now some consolidations of the changed structural form of Local 574 that had been taking place during the strike. I take the latter point first. An ever tighter organizational liaison between the membership and the leadership was forged now based on mutual understanding, confidence, and trust between membership and leadership as it had been forged in battle in the May strike. A democratic internal strike structure was now developed that became a very potent instrument in the next stage of the battle that is before us. The small organizing committee that was selected democratically as a sort of an executive committee of the larger volunteer organizing committee that had done the mobilizing of the workers generally before the May strike became constituted as what was in actuality the central leadership of the strike. The organizing committee as the central leadership in turn functioned in close liaison with a strike committee of 100. The strike committee of 100 was not just a happen chance body of a hundred people. It was 
democratically selected, adjusted, staffed, restaffed by the strikers themselves in the course of the struggle. It began with a selection of a hundred among those who had proven themselves the best in the May strike. And as the battle went on, it was adjusted some again by the strikers. That strike committee of 100 was genuinely representative of the ranks of the strikers as a whole. In a, in a uh, broad sense, this organizational internal structure of the democratic function within the ranks of this striking union was analogous to our concept in the Socialist Workers' Party of the selection of our central leading body, the National Committee. Nobody can get on the National Committee of the Socialist Workers' Party without getting the votes in the ranks. Nobody can butter up a leader and get pushed into, a, in, into the National Committee. They have to get the votes in the ranks, and there's only one way you can get the votes in the ranks, and that is to conduct yourself in such a way that the members conclude you'd make a good leader. And in that sense, this strike committee of 100, forged in the heat of the battle, was somewhat analogous to the more deliberate, conscious way in which the Socialist Workers' Party selects its, uh, its central leading body. Now, secondly, within this strike committee of 100, a strong cadre of secondary leaders emerged in the test of fire in the battles that were to come. And as you'll see at one juncture when we were getting one of Olson's double crosses, they played a crucial role in saving the strike. They proved their worth time and again and it was precisely from among these secondary leaders that developed out of the strike committee of 100 during the heat of battle that some of the staunchest and most solid members of the Socialist Workers Party came that were recruited in the heat of those struggles. <clears throat> In addition to that, frequent membership meetings were held. Whether or not the union was on strike, on strike or off. And at the membership meetings, there was always full and free discussion. None of this business of the membership gathering and the chairman doing most of the talking, some official, some bureaucrat from the platform having to say so, and the workers sitting there and listening. There was full and free discussion. Moreover, during the strikes, the ranks were kept up to date by daily reports over a loudspeaker system installed in the strike headquarters. Generally, in the evening after the day's work was over, uh, it became a tendency that the, uh, the workers would stay around for a while after the, after the evening meal in the strike commissary and, and uh, one and another, uh, not always the leaders, sometimes uh, a marshal of some particular picket detachment, or maybe again the head of the commissary committee would be giving up, they were giving them hell because they weren't bringing their dishes back to the sink after they got through eating. But, but uh, in one way and another, every night, over the loudspeaker, anybody who wanted to stay around would be brought right up to the minute. Comments would be made about what the newspapers had said in their columns and their editorials that day. Some statement some labor faker had made would be answered by one of the leaders, or some, something Olson had been, pop, had been popping off about would be analyzed and the workers would be uh, clarified uh, about it. Then, in the second strike, we developed one of the most crucial instruments of all, a daily strike paper. It was called the organizer. And this became vital in this second battle. And the workers appreciated it, they learned from it, and they were proud of it. Were they proud that their union comes out with a paper and we got guys on our side that can write just as good and even write better 
And unlike then those guys on the daily papers, and unlike them, they write the truth. And the workers, as I mentioned before, mainly the women carried the load, but the, the strikers and their supporters as a whole were enthusiastic uh, backers of the paper. And we raised enough money to keep a daily one-page tabloid going throughout the whole six-odd week period of the second strike, and even a little money to buy a few things for the commissary and one thing or another. By the device of the, of the strikers, their wives, their supporters, going out with a bundle of the daily organizer and a can. We didn't charge anything for the paper, but every time you give somebody a paper, you hold a can. And you'd be surprised how many times somebody would show up a $5 bill, even in 1934, when a $5 bill was a lot more money, relatively, than it is today. And uh, you would find people driving from in the evening from all parts of town down by the strike headquarters for the express purpose of picking up a copy of the organizer. And we developed quite a substantial circulation and became a very vital instrument for the union in the, uh, in the whole strike and was far from the least of the vanguard contributions that was made in that battle of the instrumentalities that make it possible to carry, on, carry forward a, uh, a battle in the way it ought to be carried forward. Also, the whole party was mobilized in support of the, of the party fraction leading the action in Minneapolis. Comrade Cannon, the national secretary of the party, came to Minneapolis and stayed right there and performed his central leadership function in the party by acting first and foremost right at the scene of action to do everything possible to, to mobilize the support of the party as a whole. Highly skilled writers one or two of whom today have got uh, uh, very good jobs in, in the, in the uh, editorial stable of one or another of the big weekly magazines, wrote on the Daily Organizer in, uh, in 1934. The party sent unemployed organizers who'd had experience in Pennsylvania and Ohio and in California and in Michigan and in other areas and to help us with the organization, the tightening of the liaison uh, for the mobilization of the unemployed in, uh, in support of the, uh, of the second strike. In short, it was an all-sighted demonstration of a combat party in action. A, a democratically centralized party acting as a compact unit, as a single force with a single purpose, with a single policy, and that within the framework of a combat formation, the truck drivers and inside workers of Minneapolis, who are organized in a democratic internal union structure along lines akin to democratic centralism, where in every respect there was democracy in deciding, but there was discipline in action. The leadership had unquestioned authority during combat. When we were clashing with the cops, or as later with the National Guard, any time a leader of the strike gave an order, it had to be carried out. There was no two ways about it. And if somebody in the ranks objected to carrying out, the leaders didn't have to discipline him. The rest of the ranks did. But the other side of it was, and in these regular reports and in these frequent membership meetings where there was full and democratic discussion that I mentioned to you, the policies of the leadership in the battles were subject to review and criticism by the membership. And in this you had a limited preview of future actions to be led by our vanguard party and the great class struggles that are to come. And when you think of it in these terms, you begin to get a real concrete understanding of what we mean when we say we're out to organize a loyal, disciplined, Leninist-type combat party that functions on the democratic working class principles of democratic centralism. Here you have an image of what it's all about as it occurred at this brief, 
but significantly important moment in the history of class struggle in the United States and in the history of the intervention of the Socialist Workers' Party in class struggle. Now, as I said, another problem we had was to mobilize general labor support for this new showdown with the bosses. We began here by pointing toward the organization of a mass parade all the way through the heart of the town, culminating in a mass rally at the municipal auditorium. And we got a tremendous response not only from the truck drivers and inside workers of 574, but from the rank and file of other unions and from unorganized employed workers and from, from unemployed workers. And here again, as we had done with Olson, we used some of the city politicians. There was one alderman. He had the kind of a voice he didn't need a loudspeaker. He anticipated electronics. That man could call a hog in Arkansas from the northwest corner of Nebraska. <laughs> and he was a vain, a pompous, a self-seeking, big voice, pea-sized minded man. And we found his contradiction and we put him on record for the second strike by the device of making him marshal of the parade and giving him a white horse to ride. And he did. He did. He did. As they say in Missouri, where I come from, there's more than one way to nub ducks, you know. <laughs> and in this way, we involved, again, the union bureaucrats and the reformist politicians while we were mobilizing the ranks. And some speeches were made at the auditorium that were somewhat akin to the, speech, the speeches I described to you last night that were made at the settlement of the coal strike. They're sure Olson will get this thing straightened out. We must understand Olson, and we're not going to have to strike, and so on. But Bill Brown was the last speaker, and Bill was a natural-born orator. I contend generally that uh, before anybody can speak at all, you've got to think a little about it, you've got to study it a little, you've got to practice it a little. But every once in a while, somebody comes along, it's a natural, and Bill was one. I've seen him sit down just five minutes before a meeting, take an envelope and put about six words on the back of the envelope and get up and make a stim winder speech. And that's exactly what he did at this meeting. We got about 25,000 people in this huge municipal auditorium. Brown's the last speaker, and he winds up his speech with the statement, the only good boss is a dead boss. <laughs> The next morning the papers are out, oh boy, long editorials, and the theme is Brown's Formula. <laughs> and they really went to town. Well, it was, a, it was an extremist statement, you know. Uh, <laughs> but what is it that we've heard lately, you know, about extremism and defense of liberty? <laughs> but anyway, we had him involved. Now we're at the eve of strike. And another breed of domestic political animal capitalist variety steps in, namely the federal mediator. A fellow by the name of Dunnigan, mediator assigned by the Department of Labor in Washington. I always remembered him. He wore ponce nez glasses with a black ribbon, had a row of cigars in the pocket where I got these glasses. Come to the strike headquarters. We're getting ready for the next battle. Comes in, introduces himself typical line of the mediator. This is a law with mediators in class struggle. Their role is to come in and pretend they're the friend of the workers, get the workers to give them confidence, give them authority, and then go sell you out. Their function is not to attain justice in any way, shape, or form for a working man or woman. Their justice is to prevent a strike from taking place if they can, and if one starts to get it stopped just as quick as they can with as little as possible for the workers, but above all, get it stopped. Dunnigan comes in. Well, he just got to town. Apparently, he didn't read much. And he thought he was talking to a run-of-the-mind group of workers that just come from nowhere, as was happening all over the country then, just organizing and wondering how we're organized, what we're going to do, how we go about it, and looking for somebody to give him some advice. He tells us, I understand your problem. Now... You give me uh, the authority, and I'm going to go over, and I'll talk to the governor. 
I'll get the governor to cooperate with me, and I'll go talk to the bosses. You give me a little latitude here, and I'll bring you back a settlement. We said, well, Mr. Dunnigan, we appreciate your, your uh, generous gesture, your magnificent demonstration of recognition that there's some justice on our side, but I'll tell you what you do. That's what we told you. You go over and you see the bosses. You come back and tell us what the bosses said, and then we'll tell you whether we like it or not. Well, we got into the strike and came to a new climactic point, and a second meter, mediator came in, a man by the name of Father Haas, who was part of a special federal mediation service that had been set up, and he and Dunnigan worked as a team. Now, I'm getting ahead a little, but I want to talk about mediators for a moment. At one juncture, our negotiating committee is meeting... Uh, with Haas and Dunnigan, still no direct meetings with the bosses, and they've given us what they consider a settlement, and they demand that we recommend it to the ranks. Our negotiating committee said, no, we won't. Oh, and just let me point out, this is a very important thing about negotiating, talking about tactics. It's fatal to send your negotiators into a negotiation with power to settle because they're behind the eight ball. They're subject to get shoved off in the room and all the pressure in the world is put on them. And, and, and you put your, your negotiators and the organization itself in jeopardy. The, the strongest position for a negotiator is never have authority to say yes or no. They'll take it back. It serves the dual function of keeping you in the best possible strategic position in negotiating and minimizing the dangers of somebody weakening and selling you out when they go in there as your negotiator. Haas and Dunnigan tried to do this to our negotiating team, and when it was refused, they demanded the right to go before the committee of 100 with their proposition. And they were allowed to go before the committee of 100. And as they were leaving the hall after the meeting, and the workers had told them out in no uncertain terms, you would have witnessed the spectacle of a young Irish Catholic truck driver reach down inside his shirt, rip the crucifix off his neck, and hurl it into the face of the priest mediator as he walked out of the meeting. Class struggle is very educational in many ways. <clears throat> now, in the second walkout, we very quickly came to the most brutal phase of all the fighting, what is known as Bloody Friday. The police laid a trap, this time in the wholesale grocery district. The police had now had been equipped with riot guns. It's a shotgun type of weapon that carries a number four slug. And it's just one small stage short of a dumb, dumb bullet. It's a vicious thing. It's a vicious thing. They laid a trap, and they opened fire on the unarmed pickets. They shot down over 50 pickets in a matter of 10 minutes. Most of them shot in the back, trying to escape from the guns, two of them killed. The immediate reaction of the workers was to go home and get their revolvers, their shotguns, their deer rifles, souvenir bayonets from World War I, trench knives, anything they could lay hands on for a weapon and come back to the strike headquarters with it. Seething with anger, intimidated, terrorized, no, no. And here you have the positive side of the democratic illusion in work. The negative side of it is that until the lessons of class struggle life teaches them otherwise, workers think they really got some democratic rights in this capitalist society of the <coughs> class analysis. The positive side is when they find out it's not so, as these workers were finding out, then the positive side comes forward 
in the sense that they fight for what they truly thought were their rights that they feel are being taken away. And they look at the cop as the violator of the law of the land, not themselves, and they propose to take the law in their own hands. That first and fundamental law that's, that's basic to all nature, the law of self-defense. The duty of the strike leadership was to disarm them. It wasn't a pleasant task. But you'll find the more you attain responsibility as a leader, that there's a lot about being a leader that is not pleasant. Anybody that wants to have a lark, to have a good thing with all kinds of honors, not too much responsibility, and feel that you're free from problems because you can decide, don't ever set out to be a leader because that's not the way it is. That's not the way it is. A leader has got to be conscious, and a leader has got to know why and how sometimes to do things that at that moment of rage the workers can't understand. And believe you me, it's not easy. But if the leadership had just stood supinely and let the workers go out on the streets and take after those cops, if not, if, if, uh, in those circumstances, the kind of a bloodbath would have developed that would have been inherent in the situation, we'd have had the whole federal army in Minneapolis in no time at all. <laughs> you couldn't win. You couldn't win. So the duty of the leadership was to disarm those strikers, send them out without arms. Now what saved the situation was a combination of the anger, the determination of the workers, and the new waves of support. The bosses thought they were terrorizing. If anything, we got more support. Well, around town, the minute the city learned about Bloody Friday than we'd had before. The anger, the determination that came out of that, the fact we had these flying squadrons by this time so skillfully organized and tooled and manned and led, and the fact the cops didn't know the leadership had disarmed the strikers. Those were the things that saved the situation. The cops began to escort one truck at a time. You had the spectacle, they would take a truck, anything, whatever, and there would be a convoy of about 40 prowl cars, four cops to a car, four riot guns sticking out the windows of the prowl car like uh, machine guns out of a tank. 20 of them in front of the truck, 20 behind, and they would always go right through the heart of the downtown sector for the demonstration. And you would find 80 picket cars flanking the 40 carloads of cops. So you'd have three abreast, the cops in the middle, two lines of picket cars. We wouldn't try to stop it, but we just add it to the parade. And the cops didn't know whether or not there were guns in those picket cars, and you know, they really didn't want to find out. Well, the cops do this a couple of times, and then they would begin to reduce the number of squad cars to a truck. And the minute they reduced the number of squad cars, we'd redouble the number of picket cars. And this would convince them that we're going to begin stopping them now. And they'd shift back. And it just became tug and saw here, and it became impossible for them. Olson had to intervene. So he cooked up a scheme with Haas and Dunnigan. They came up with what they called the Haas-Dunnigan plan. It was a lousy thing, but it did have union recognition. It did grant a certain recognition of the right to an increase in pay. It did recognize drivers and inside workers. It did have the seniority clause. It did have certain regulations on hours and overtime. It did have a guarantee that all strikers will be returned their job without... Uh, discrimination, and Olson announced that the haas Dunnigan plan is going to be presented to the union and to the bosses, and if it is rejected by either side, he is going to declare martial law and enforce the haas Dunnigan plan as the terms of settlement of the strike. Now, it was laid for us, naturally, but here again we managed to outthink them. A deadline was set of noon on a certain day, I think it was a Saturday. It was a very hot day, I remember. 
We met in a big hall over on the east side in Minneapolis. Why I remember it was hot it was because we wanted to make sure, the deadline was noon, and we wanted to make sure that the bosses didn't get any word until the deadline as to the union action. As we figured the bosses would count on us rejecting the settlement, and then they would accept it, and Olson would turn the guard loose on us. We closed all the windows. We had thousands of men in this huge auditorium. We closed all the windows. And we had ourselves a meeting. All the, the workers were sore about it. It was, it was an unfair, rotten settlement. But we, we thrashed it out there. We debated it from every point of view. And we came out with a unanimous vote that the workers understood of the tactical necessity of the union accepting the Haas Dunningham plan. We told them we don't think the bosses are going to accept it, we don't think it's going to end the strike, but you have to assume that possibility, but this is why we got to do it. And we'd made the decision a couple of hours before the deadline, and with everybody's agreement, and everybody just sweltering and suffering, we sat there till just a few minutes before the deadline. Bill Brown went to the telephone, called the governor, and said the union accepts the Haas Dunningham plan. The bosses hadn't said a word. A couple hours later, they announced they accepted with reservations, which was that they didn't accept it at all. And with this, Olson declared martial law and installed the National Guard headquarters in the armory in downtown Minneapolis, threw the troops out on the streets. Pretty soon you had these farm boys, their bayonets, walking back and forth under the awnings of the stores downtown and getting the bayonet caught in the awning and damn near cutting their throat. But uh, <coughs> uh, he announces that out at the, any, any employer comes out to the National Guard headquarters and signs the Haas Dunnigan plan can operate. So all the small fry bosses, little one-horse outfits that never intended to live up to anything they signed anyway, they all rush down and sign. Pretty soon all the trucks of these little operators are out with a big with a big uh, 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 poster on the front of the windshield, operating by permission of the military authorities under the Haas Dunnigan plan. <laughs> and we go this way for a while, and uh, the uh, big bosses begin to put the heat on. They take Olson to court and try to get an injunction against martial law, and then they start claiming that... Uh, uh, this is interfering with interstate commerce. We're depriving sick people in hospitals. All the pressures in the world are put on, and little by little, Olson begins to let other trucks operate under military control. In short, he's beginning to break the strike on a piecemeal basis. So we held a protest rally of the Union at a big public playground known as the Parade Grounds, where we denounced this whole thing and announced to one and all that the union is going out the next day and whether or not there's any tin hats along, if a truck is on the streets that the, that the owner hasn't signed up and under the Haas Dunnigan plan, we're going to stop it. Well, about four o'clock the next morning, some of us are in the headquarters and suddenly we hear, how does the poet say, the measured tread of booted feet. The National Guard is marching up the street from the army and surrounding the strike headquarters. They surround the whole block and they train machine guns on the front doors of the headquarters that the picket cars came in and out of. And the colonel in command of the guard, a judge from Duluth, Minnesota, comes in and announces he's taking possession. And he's got a list of the names of the leaders of the strike. And don't think the bosses didn't know who the leaders were. He didn't have any of the formal executive board. He had the real leadership of the strike on his list. They got some of the leaders. The first one they got was Ray Dunn. One or two of us managed to get through the police lines or the military lines by a ruse. And uh, they had set up a military stockade at the state fairground out in the edge of town. They threw all the leaders they could grab in there and they began arresting pickets and throwing them in there. And in the headquarters were still all these guns and bayonets and butcher knives we'd taken away from the 
pickets on Bloody Frank. And so the military, they sort all these out and they got them laid out on a table, all tagged. Newspapers come in, take pictures of them. The evening papers have got huge pictures, you know, this arsenal that is found in the strike headquarters. But meantime, Olson has sent word through the union bureaucrats that he wants to meet a rank and file committee of the union, and here's where the secondary leaders come into the picture. Secondary leaders that have been developing in the strike committee of 100. They, Olson meets them in the offices of the Labor Review, the official paper of the Central Labor Union, in case you don't think there was some canavery going on between Olson and the bureaucrats. They come in, the o Olson, he was an old dock walloper. When he was with workers, he liked, liked to play the worker angle. He chewed Yankee girl tobacco. And he, workers there, he liked to put his feet upon a table and get a gobloon over and take a chew of tobacco and spit, you know, and talk worker's language. And so he pulls his tobacco out of his pocket and starts passing around this rank and file committee. It, had, it happened to be Kelly Postal, Ray Rainbow, and Jack Maloney couple of three pretty tough cookies as they go. He passes the pack around, they take it, by the time he gets back to the governor, there's no Yankee girl. So he has to sit there and look at his platoon while the, the rank and file committee chooses to choose his tobacco. All he wants, he gives them a song and dance, and they tell him, all right, we want to be reasonable. Now, just a couple of things we want you to do, governor. Well, anything within reason. What is it you want? Well, they say, one, let our leaders out of your stockade. Two, give us back our strike headquarters. Three, take your troops off the streets. Then we'll be willing to talk contract. <laughs> Meantime, those of us in the central leadership that the military hadn't, hadn't managed to grab, together with the others on the strike committee of 100, have organized auxiliary headquarters all over town, generally using friendly filling stations. And uh, a little mayhem is being committed, not only on the trucks on the street, but on some soldiers, too. It was quite an afternoon. The casualty lists in the paper the next morning made somewhat instructive and interesting reading for statisticians that like to uh, study things like that from that point of view. Between what's happening to his tin hats and the scab trucks that he's let loose under military protection and the, way, and the hard time he's having, with the uh, rank and file committee and the editorial office's labor review, Olson decided he had to back off. So he admitted finally that it was a mistake. They had claimed that we hadn't had a permit for our public rally the night before, which we had had, by the way. He knew it. But now he says a mistake, and he orders the military to restore the headquarters. The amusing thing. Uh, one of the uh, one of the secondary leaders of the strike goes up, and he thought justice is justice. And among other things, he made the commander of the military detachment that was holding down the headquarters account on his own inventoried list for every revolver, rifle, shotgun, trench knife, and what have you that they had seized the day they raided the headquarters. We got the headquarters back, and it developed into a sits creek. Olson had to back off. The police hadn't been able to break the strike. They hadn't been able to break the strike with the military. They hadn't been able to outflank the leadership of the strike and, and, and uh, defeat the, tri the strike by tricking the membership. See the value of a, of a tightly knit, democratically organized, uh, consciously functioning machine when you're in a battle? What were they going to do? It developed into a sitzkrieg. It settled down, in fact, to a war of nerves, to a process of attrition. Now, we were pretty worn down by that, I can tell you. <laughs> this battle had been going on quite a while. But here's another important thing to keep in mind. At these, in these kind of clutches, and you're in a fight, you know, and you're beginning to feel awful tired, Always remember, the other guy is not necessarily as fresh as a daisy anymore. And if you can hang on just a little bit longer by the skin of your teeth, sometimes you'll win. You know, this theme uh, novelists are so fond of using about 
how one guy is slicker than another and he's just pounding the devil out of him in a fist fight because of his superior skill, but the other guy is more rugged and he's taking it. He can seldom get a blow in and all of a sudden he found he's won because the other guy just falls from exhaustion. He can't throw another punch. <laughs> uh, these, factors, these factors operate in, strugg in struggles of this kind. And just when we were on the ropes and actually beginning to talk about the problem of how to call off the strike and at least get some of the best militants back on the job if we could, the boss is folded. It took the form of a special mediator coming in as a face-saving device and a formula that was a sort of a combination of the haas dunnigan plan and the utilization of the collective bargaining election through the National Labor Relations Board that, that had, uh, had appeared in the case of the coal strike was put together. And on that basis, the bosses agreed to a settlement that while it wasn't what the workers deserved, as it was looked over in a cold, hard, and calculated way, we had to recognize it was much as much as we could get at the time. It, it, it established, it legalized the union and the industry, and it gave us the point of departure to go ahead now with the union building job. And on that basis, we settled the strike. 